So good evening, everyone. I'm Nicola Di Cosma, I'm the Luz Foundation Professor of East Asian Studies at the Institute. And uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome all of you to this uh, Roger Covey Distinguished Lecture in Pre-Modern China, which is very generously um, uh, sponsored by the Tang Research Foundation. It's an honor and a great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Patricia Buckley Ibrey, Professor Emerita at the University of Washington. So I apologize for my voice is a little low. <laughs> she is and has been for a long time a leading historian in Chinese history, specializing in the social and cultural history of middle period China, and in particular, the Tang and Song dynasties. She recently retired from the University of Washington as the William Family Endowed Professor of History. And I'm going to share with you a few career highlights. Immediately after receiving her PhD from Columbia University in 1975, she was hired as visiting assistant professor at the University of Illinois. Uh, that position was then uh, turned to an assistant professorship and then associate professorship and finally full professorship. Uh, during this time, she uh, also covered a number of administrative positions, including head of department and so on. In 1997, uh, Pat was appointed as professor of history at the University of Washington, where she also di directed the A East Asia Center. Her many visiting positions include the University of Kyoto, Princeton University, Munster University, the Chinese University of Hong Kong, and most importantly, the Institute for Advanced Study, <laughs> where she was a visiting professor in 1998-1999 as the person who spearheaded a new initiative within the School of Historical Studies to establish a permanent position in East Asian Studies, which is today the Henry Luce Foundation Professorship. I will say a few more things about her stay at the Institute in a few minutes. First, let me say a few more things about her position in the field. Uh, Pat has been a pioneer in social and cultural history, opening new, new areas of investigation, especially in relations to the history of women, the family, and social and gender relations in pre-modern China. She has authored eight books. She has edited or co-edited about nine, 10 books. Just to give you a sense of her, of the weight of her production, um, let me just mention a few of them. 1978, Aristocratic Families in Early Imperial China, a case study of Wu Lungzui family, which was reissued in 2009. Uh, Confucianism and Family Rituals in Imperial China, a social history of writing about rights, which Princeton University Press published in 1991. Women and the Family in Chinese History, and Inner Quarters, Marriage and Lives of Chinese Women in the Song Period, uh, published in 1993. While at the IAS in 1999-1999, she became an ambitious new project on visual culture during the Song Dynasty. This was an extremely productive time, as far as we can judge from the large production of, of books and articles that came out of it. And uh, I was actually fortunate to be here as a member in the spring of 1999 and be a, a witness to the energy and passion that Pat was putting into this new, new project. Just as a few, uh, again, few highlights of what came out of it. Uh, in 2008, she published Accumulating Culture, the collection of Emperor Huizong, and a very large, very important work uh, came out in 2014, Emperor of Weizong, uh, um, 700 pages from <laughs> Harvard University Press, a really major, major work. But she has also collaborated with a number of other scholars and edited very important works. Um, again, um, staying with the material culture and the visual culture, the uh, book Visual and Material Cultures of Middle, Imper Middle Period China, which was co-edited with Susan Huang. And um, 
and many other edited projects that go from state power in medieval, in medieval China to um, more recently biographical and autobiographical writing, which is also extremely interesting. But we should not forget also her work on educational texts and outreach. And um, because that has been also a very important area of your production with um, uh, a, a book on a guidebook or, or, or a source book uh, called uh, Chinese Civilization, a source book. The very important Cambridge Illustrated History of China, reprinted many times, East Asia, a cultural, social, and political history, and a history of world societies, also reprinted many times. Um, Pat is the general editor uh, and founding editor of the Journal of Chinese History, an important journal in the field, which started its publication in 2017 with the first issue. Uh, she is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, elected in 2016. She received the award for scholarly distinction from the American Historical Association in 2014. In other words, um, she's been a real protagonist of uh, East Asian and Chinese studies in particular for a very long time. As such, she will talk today about to us about her latest project, which um, is uh, perhaps um, a reflection about the history of the field, um, which I find especially timely since, um, you know, it, the humanities in general are starting to interrogate themselves uh, about their future directions. So without further ado, please welcome Patricia Abraham. I think I'll see if I can move this up here to see my own PowerPoints. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. And it's certainly a great pleasure to be here and talk to you about my new project. Uh, I will say I've been working on this not quite a year yet. So I'm very much still in the uh, thinking things through. So I very much welcome uh, people's suggestions, advice, other things I should consider. Um, I'm trying to do the big picture. So why am I working on this project? So uh, with the Journal of Chinese History, we do a special issue every year. And the one for this year is on traditions of Sinology. This was uh, edited by Josh Fogel. And um, these are sort of review articles. So we didn't think they needed to go out for review. So I read them at each one as they came in to make sure you know, they were ready to publish. Uh, they're all quite good. I especially recommend Pierre Tinville on French Sinology. But as I read them, I kept thinking how different the US story was. He didn't commission one for the US or North America. Um, but you know, the French, the Germans, the British, they already had, I think even the Belgians already had a separate book <laughs> on the history of, uh, they would usually say Sinology. I'm saying Chinese studies just as a more common term here. Uh, if you've got access to a research library, these things you can find by um, putting in Journal of Chinese History, it'll take you to the Cambridge site and these are all available on first view. So what kinds of sources are there for this? Memoirs and biographies are a very big source. So the people who, um, the list I have there, I don't think any of them are living. Um, there's a lot of people have written memoirs. They're very interesting. Um, then there's interviews and oral histories, and they can be even more fun. The two I've been reading most uh, recently are Elizabeth Huff and Wing Zi Chan. Um, there's a kind of informality about an oral history. Some uh, uh, Yuan Ren Zhao is done by the widow of Joseph Levinson. Um, and she did several. And that's sort of interesting because she sort of knew these people at the field. Um, of course, there's obituaries, feshrifts, book reviews. Uh, if you want some good quantitative data, there's uh, reports to funders about what things are done, and they commissioned um, 
reviews of the field and so on. Uh, many of you know Frank Schulman for years put out these lists of dissertations. You can also, again, with a uh, good research library, go into ProQuest dissertations. And since about 1992, you can search somebody as the, an advisor and see who they've put out as students, uh, periodical scholarly studies. And I'll give you some examples of scholarly studies. And I put these um, uh, alphabetically. You can see they're pretty varied. Um, but I'm going to draw your attention to David Hollinger. So um, one of my friends said, this project is much too big. You can't possibly cover it all. But I really like this um, Protestants abroad. He's taking a big subject, but he brings in real people. And so I think, OK, that's an example. You, the project can be big, but try to make an interesting story and bring people into it. Um, David uh, Honey does uh, some stuff, but he's just picking certain people. There's a lot of people who are not at Berkeley who um, uh, Martin Kern is here. He wrote this very interesting article on German sinologists. Another article length one I strongly recommend is a recent one by Pauline Yu on the ACLS and the promotion of Chinese studies back in the uh, 20s and 30s, pretty much. And then, of course, there's a lot of studies of uh, individual authors. So what are some of the really big differences between the European traditions and the US traditions? Well, as um, probably all of you guess, Europe starts much earlier. You get you know, the Jesuit missionaries and stuff like this. Uh, the educated in most European countries through the 19th century, New Greek and Latin, they had a certain kind of approach to distant texts. And they usually started their approach to Chinese studies with that kind of background. Then it was very clear to me as I read this stuff that Chinese play a much bigger role in Chinese studies in the US than they did in Europe. You know, partially because we're um, an immigrant nation. Uh, more Chinese came here starting in the teens. Um, the missionary schools in China, uh, a lot of them were taught by uh, Americans. You know, there were some British too, but I think more Americans. So they uh, got a bit familiar with that. And then the US has so many colleges, there were lots of places to go. There are on that list of studies, there's been several interesting studies about the early Chinese who came to the US. Um, and you, you do want to keep in mind, most of them are in the sciences and engineering, and most of them never come back. Um, and then again, comparing to Europe, in uh, World War II, the US is the big one fighting in, in uh, the Pacific, the Europeans are busy fighting in Europe. So there's more done by the military and the State Department to train people in Chinese and Japanese than was the case in the Europe. Uh, and then we get an expansion of higher education, especially in the 50s and 60s. So there's more jobs created. So I'm just going to give you a now. So I'm thinking of taking 20 years for each chapter. So five chapters, the things I'm thinking about at this time, sometimes I haven't really written any of it yet, but I think it needs to go there. Uh, but I've thought about the openings of each chapter. And I think uh, for 1920, there are uh, information we can have. If you were an undergraduate at uh, college in the US, probably there's not a single course you could take on China. There's a, a good survey from 1927, um, over 500 colleges that get answers back from like 480, only 100 have anything. And of those, uh, most of them have one class and that class is usually US Far Eastern relations taught by somebody in American diplomatic history. That is not somebody who knows any Far Eastern languages. Um, if you look at the faculty, and we have a good list for that period, um, from again, American Council of Learning Societies study, where they asked, uh, tell us all your courses, who teaches them, what degrees that person has. Um, people who had returned from China 
are the bulk of those teaching. Uh, more than half, I would say, missionary families. They may have been the children of missionaries rather than missionaries. And so some are returned missionaries of, you know, age 50. They've been 20 years in China. Some returned um, uh, people who worked for the government in various capacities. Uh, many people don't have PhDs yet. So 1920s and 30s, you could still teach at many respectable colleges without a PhD. Um, then we get this. Uh, in this period, the American Council of Learned Societies and the Rockefeller Foundation begin to put in some significant money to develop this field. Certainly very important is the Harvard Yenjing Institute. So this is uh, money that uh, was uh, American money. Um, somehow the people at Harvard were very clever in convincing the trustees of this estate to uh, set up this institute um, with Yanjing University, which was a Christian university and Harvard, but it did a lot of things for the field. Um, it gave fellowships to people uh, in the US who, who are not Chinese to go to China and study. And it also brought people from China uh, to the uh, US for a year or more. And uh, then it was really focused on Yanjing University. After 49, it really was at Harvard. Um, OK, in this period, something else that's quite interesting is uh, quite a few of the people who are not Chinese who are gonna be leaders in the field, spend three to five years in China, uh, mostly in Beijing. So when I had my pictures there, um, like Fairbank would be one of them where uh, you could go, it's quite inexpensive, but there'd be many other uh, people in the field, Creel and Cracky and Bada, and uh, many people of that generation, they all knew each other because they're pretty much, pretty much in Beijing because of library resources. Um, but you're also getting some interesting collaborations. I think the most interesting one um, is the eminent Chinese of the Qing period. So this Arthur Hummel becomes the librarian uh, for the Far Eastern Library, the Library of Congress. Uh, he was of missionary background and um, they get a grant. They're able to hire quite a few people to work on the project. Two of the best known are Fang Zhao Ying and his wife, Du Lianzhe. They spend, are supported for several years and go on and do other things and are supported. But some, some people as research scholars rather than uh, he never really taught either of them. Okay, moving on to the 1940s and 50s. World War II is obviously the really big thing. Um, so I would start the opener with uh, Fairbank himself. Already in 1940 is... Um, drafted, not drafted in the sense it was probably no choice, but induced to uh, take a leave from Harvard and work for the government as they're trying to prepare for the war. And over the next several years, sort of um, anyone in the field who could possibly be brought into this project was. Many were sent to China. They're working for the Office of War Information, um, other kinds of State Department things. There's also uh, some people who are um, conscientious objectors who spend several years in China driving trucks around. Um, so they're not having guns, but they're helping the war effort and learning about China at the same time. Okay, uh, they run big army language schools. So you can point to people like the professor at um, Princeton for many years, Fritz Mote, uh, learns it in Chinese language school. Uh, that would be true of a lot of people of that generation. And then with the GI Bill, okay, maybe you were drafted at 18 and taught Chinese and you spent some time in Asia, but then you're gonna have free college afterwards uh, with the GI Bill. So you, that would be a big part. Not much time goes by and we get the, you know, um, the PRC, the Korean War, the McCarthy hearings, you get into this very uh, political phase. And something that I hadn't known before, and so maybe a uh, fair number of you didn't know either, I hadn't really thought it through, is uh, after 45, lots of Chinese students come back um, to the US, like the Boxer Indemnity Scholarships had been put on hold during the war. 
And then that money dies in 48 or 49. Uh, so they're in a big scramble. And it takes through much of the 50s uh, for them to figure out how to handle this. Most of those um, foreign students were official literati, upper elite level, going back to China was maybe not their ideal thought at that time. And actually for two years, the US government wasn't letting them go back. So if you wanted to get a job in the US, you often had to switch to China as a subject. So somebody like um, Ha Bingdi had done English history, Xiao Gong Chuan had done political theory and stuff. They have to um, be able to market themselves as China experts to get jobs. No one's going to hire Hubbing D to teach English economic history. Um, and that sort of takes through much of the 50s for many of these people then to find stable positions. Um, to me, the 50s um, was also this period of this uh, series of wonderful conference volumes on the Chinese uh, civilization and its thought and institutions, those things. So things were going on. Uh, I don't know fully what was uh, funding these things. I think of it also as preparing for instruction. So you get a fair bank along with Reichauer doing the old uh, East Asia great tradition, and you get De Barry and Wing Sichan working on sources of Chinese tradition. So it wasn't until this period that we get much undergrad and Hewitt instructional material. But by the end of the 50s, there's quite a bit. Um, I think the last one I have down there is a kind of tension. This was a period as you get into the 50s is certainly high Cold War. So are we learning about China to assist the government? Or is it more uh, there's things we should learn because it's part of uh, human culture, there's wisdom, there's uh, reasons to study it for itself. And some of this can be rephrased in terms of humanities versus social sciences. Okay, 60s and 70s. And here I thought a good opener was the case of the University of Michigan. If you said, okay, what's going on up to 1960? The bulk of the PhD students are coming from the sort of obvious suspects, uh, Harvard, Yale, Columbia, Berkeley, and Washington, I think are the really big ones. Um, but now there's new money. In 1959-60, Michigan gets $3 million for international studies, and they designate $1.6 million for China. And this is a time when a new assistant professor's salary, $6,000, would be great. Uh, so they hire um, a floor worker, a floor worker, and over the next decade, he becomes chair of China studies. They add 15 lines. So this is a period of enormous growth. Um, many other places grow. I think Michigan probably is the top one. The people who are coming out, who started in the late 50s and are finishing up in the early 60s, there's jobs everywhere. Almost anybody, you look at their trajectory, they uh, moved three times. They got, kept getting other offers. And it's all very informal in this period. But as you get into the 60s, of course, it's the Vietnam War era. Um, that isn't that big a thing until maybe 66 or so, but you start getting um, a real sense of a kind of, um, to me, there's a kind of difference between the teachers who had been the World War II generation and the students who are almost universally anti-war. Um, so you get a kind of tension between the faculty and the students. This is a really big thing. Um, the Committee of Concerned Asian Scholars, more than half the people who were active were China people. And Fabio Lanza has written a book that was one of the things I listed there that's pretty much trying to recover that period where many of the people were. This is also the beginning of the Cultural Revolution. They had... Um, 
very positive views of what Mao was doing in the Cultural Revolution. They're sort of um, buying into it, which well, you know will change later on. But that was a bit the mood of the mid '60s to early '70s. Okay, another thing that's going on is okay. You can't go to China. Maybe I didn't say that, but maybe most of you know. After 1950, uh, Americans couldn't go to China, but you could go to Taiwan. You could go to Hong Kong, and this is also a period where social sciences are growing. Um, rise of anthropology. The Anthropologists go to both Taiwan and Hong Kong. A lot of important work is done uh, in history. It's a period of social and economic history that is influenced by what's going on in Europe. Um, another thing that begins to happen in this period, beginning in the late 60s, okay, you, you got your degree at Harvard and very high proportion do get their degrees from Harvard. And then you get a job in, you know, Indiana, that would be not at all unusual. And so how do you keep up with the people who might be interested in reading your work? People start making these small societies. So there's early China, there's a region that's called Qing studies, there's Ming studies, there's Tang studies, um, but all those are periods. And then there's other ones, there's China Pearl, people are interested in performing arts. You know, there's, um, people are finding a way to stay connected to those with similar intellectual interests, even though they're no longer uh, where they were trained, where they uh, had a lot of people they could talk to. You begin to get women entering the field, and I'll show you uh, something in a chart a little bit later. Um, very few before 1960 entering the field. Um, and then, you know, after 76 or so, some people start either short-term visits to China um, or slightly longer. It's not until 79 that many people are able to go for a whole year. Um, and then one thing I've tried to think about is, is there technology that changes the life of scholars? And now we're getting into a period I know that I started Chinese as an undergraduate in 1966 and graduate school starting in 68. Um, to me, one of the most exciting early things was when a photocopy shop opened just a block away from the library and they would let you take a journal out and make a copy of it. Um, you know, so that there was technology that was exciting back in those days too. Um, 80s and 90s, I thought an interesting way to open this chapter that highlights both that women are getting in the field and people are excited about the chance to go back to China or to go to China, really, these people mostly hadn't ever. And so I started noticing, I had always loved the book that Emily Honig and Gail Hershatter did about being uh, graduate students staying in the dormitory at Fudan and all the women they got to know, um, personal voices it's called. And I knew that Charlotte Firth and Tani Barlow had gone there teaching uh, to go there. Uh, Marjorie Wolf and Norma Diamond went to do uh, field research and they both wrote about that. Uh, Vera Schwartz, similarly. So you could find men who are doing this, this period, but that's sort of bringing that out highlights. Okay, there's women in a variety of different fields now, and everybody wants to get back to China or to China. Most of these ones hadn't done that. They were opportunities to do smaller research projects, not staying for a year, but going for a few months. And you begin to get Chinese students coming back to the US. Uh, say 80, 81, 82, it's mostly visiting scholars in the sciences and then you begin to get graduate students in the sciences. Maybe by 85 or so, you're getting uh, graduate students in humanities and social sciences. Huge impact of the protests, 1989. That was a period a little like today when a lot of scholars said, am I ever gonna go back to China? But after two years, they did. Uh, the 90s, you get the China's rise, and I think a big period of, of um, additional jobs in Chinese studies. Schools that had had uh, only one person teaching China thought they needed two or three. Certainly a place that had no one teaching China thought they at least needed one. So that was a good time for people looking for jobs. And you similarly get this growth in undergraduate enrollments in Chinese language. Um, there's certainly lots of new intellectual trends, but if we look at that technology, you know, okay, what was the technology that was exciting in this period? Word processing. 
I think my first word processing was like 1982. And that was, you know, really exciting, not having to retype the whole page. Um, and then when you got online library catalogs, um, that also was a, a big thing. And when you could find out what was in other libraries, there were some big fat catalogs of, of reprinting the catalog cards from a few libraries, but not, you know, not all across the country. Um, and then uh, on the most recent 20 years, I thought I would start, I think some really big things of this period is the internationalization of the field and um, having so many people from the PRC. So I thought a good way to open is with the um, art historian who's now at the University of Chicago and has been for a long time, um, who seems to operate easily uh, equally easily, both in the US and China, running conferences, both places, exhibitions, both places, uh, training lots and lots of students and so on. So you do get this shift, I think, in the makeup of the student body. Uh, a lot of places today, um, the graduate student body would be more than half from the PRC. Um, it's much more, you know, there's these general social trends, like the cost of airfare going down. So People will fly just for a conference, which I know when I went with maybe a Fulbright 1971-72, the amount of money they gave me to live on was $2,000 and the airplane ticket cost $2,000. You know, and that's just a very different kind of phenomenon today. People, maybe you have to pay $2,000 for your airfare, but that doesn't mean the same thing. And people will pay that even if you're just gonna go for a week. Um, as the field grows, people are become more specialized, narrower topics. Um, I think the digital revolution in access to text is enormous. Um, it makes a huge difference. I've been trying to uh, get rid of the books in my office, and nobody wants dictionaries anymore. I used to have, you know, a copy of the dictionary at home and a copy in my office. And Nobody wants them. Uh, we used to use place name dictionaries. And now, if at least you know the Chinese characters for the uh, place, you just put it in Google and you get a map um, as well as all sorts of facts about it. It's, you know, the, the sort of day-to-day -day life of scholarship has changed quite a bit. Um, so many texts are available and so many are um, is one I love myself is Academia Sinica's uh, Scripta Sinica, where there's enormous amount of body stuff that you can uh, search in all sorts of ways. So you say, gee, is this an illusion? Uh, you know, we used to have to spend a lot of time figuring that out. And now you can put it in there and find all the earlier uses of that. You know, you may have to try, uh, I'll just use a shorter phrase or something like that, because you know, an illusion can drop a character or two but it just does change the nature of scholarship. Um, and that's something I've noticed just as I've been tracing people's lives. A fair number of the Chinese scholars after they retired in the US uh, went back to China, some to live permanently, some to uh, be there for five years, uh, probably depending sometimes whether they had grown children in the US, did they eventually come back? Um, that wasn't something so common back in the day when, you know, it was a four week boat trip, when now it's a different sort of thing that way. Okay, so I see this as a kind of narrative with intersecting trajectories. Clearly, US China relations is certainly uh, important and developments in both countries. I think that there is this interaction and collaboration between native speakers and language learners. Um, at the conference I was at last week, people were talking about insiders and outsiders, somewhat of the same idea, um, expansion of US education and employment opportunities, founding of scholarly societies, I mentioned that. Uh, funding is certainly a big thing. Uh, which foundations are interested? What are they interested in? What will they give it for? Um, intellectual change has to be part of this story. The rise of the social sciences, religious studies, women's studies, environmental studies, transnational studies. Uh, most of these you can sort of see here's when uh, key uh, things uh, entered the general academic discourse. I think there's social change that affects career patterns, that is general social change. I think I can 
deal with that a little more. And then I've mentioned some of the technological changes that affects the day-to-day -day life of scholars. Okay, so here's an example. The, the blue is not showing up the way it should have. These are some of the uh, early PhDs in the US who later became um, faculty in Chinese studies. And I, in my original, it was a blue for all those that were not China. And most of these were not. They're very often switching from um, you know, general linguistics into Chinese linguistics as they teach. Some of the ones who were more, there are a few, but more than half were not China there. Um, okay. And so I've thought a little bit about um, the Chinese who uh, make their careers in the US and those who go back, even though say they wrote a book in English, that their dissertation was so good that they wrote a book. And you know, some of them were more leftists. They were committed to the uh, communist cause and those ones certainly went back. Um, some of the ones who saw more value in Chinese civilization and culture were more inclined to say teaching it here would be a good thing. Um, reading uh, memoirs, it is interesting, at least me thinking about it, of uh, many of them I found that the Chinese memoirs, most of the people they socialize with are other Chinese. So is this just that's comfortable? Um, uh, or, you know, is are some of them here just because that was a better job and they didn't really like American society. You could point to these people like Hummel, George Taylor, Fairbank, they do hire a lot as research assistants. Um, I think they probably honestly thought these people need jobs, this is good for them, I'm helping them out. Some of them may felt a little bit um, exploited too. You know, there's a Fairbank and Deng Xiu have a bibliographical guide. And someone told me, you know, oh, Deng Xiu said, I did all the work. Um, you know, did clearly feel he wasn't getting as much credit as Fairbank. Um, and then a lot of funding was labeled as national defense. So is this troubling to any? I've also wondered about um, how distinct the generations are on the Chinese side compared to the Western side. I, I see sort of distinct generations on the Western side of this. I'm not sure it's quite as clear on the Chinese side. So let me give you an example or two. Um, Wing Zichan. So uh, I did know Wing Zichan. He was often at Columbia where I was a graduate student. And he is the closest I could find to somebody who was not of elite background that the people who, all the people who got in through the Boxer Indemnity, they're, they're from uh, literati or official families or have government connections or merchant wealth or whatever. Um, he was from, maybe many people know Toison, Kaiping is sort of next to it. It's one of these six counties that sent out lots of emigres from um, Southwest of uh, Guangzhou, Canton. Um, his father and his uncle uh, worked in laundries in the US. He would come back every four years and beget another child. And then when his father died, he skipped one. So Wing Zichan himself didn't meet his own father till he's 10. So while his father is in the US as a laundryman, um, he's not there. Um, but he does go to uh, first to Hong Kong, he wants a modern education. His father says, that's okay. Um, Hong Kong for one year. And then there was Lingnan University, a Christian university in Guangzhou. He does high school and college there. And then um, th they taught at least half their subjects in English. Uh, he has an interesting story of uh, getting into Harvard as a graduate student. Um, it shows up in 1924. He stops at three places and they all say, okay, yeah, we could enroll you. <laughs> and at Harvard, the uh, dean has a kind of interview with him and says, okay, you know, um, yeah, you can, you can enroll. 
Um, this is, you know, none of this applying a year before or anything like that, but he's totally self-funded. So he's getting money from his uh, father and now his elder brother is working in um, laundry and restaurant. He uh, worked all summers at family uh, restaurant or laundry, has to take off a whole year working as a, a waiter in the symphony restaurant in Boston. Uh, he's one of the few who did a China subject because he's not, if you were a boxer and indemnity scholar, you were committed to doing things that would help China, you know, like learn engineering. Um, he taught, uh, he did go back to China and was a dean at Lingnan University. Um, I think 37, he goes to Hawaii. And then a little later, he's most of his career is at Dartmouth. Um, after he retires from Dartmouth, he's a few years at Chatham, another undergraduate school near Pittsburgh. But he is absolutely a, a terribly important as a translator of philosophical texts. He did his own uh, source book, and he did a lot in Dubarry's sources of Chinese tradition. I don't know for sure, but I doubt it was under half. Um, and Irene Bloom, who was a classmate of mine at Columbia, uh, did an oral history of him, which is, is quite interesting. This, they spent many days um, sitting down, and, and he's talking, and she's taping it, and then it's typed up. Okay, so this is my sort of overview where I've taken just three universities to show you that there are some uh, common patterns that you get uh, uh, Columbia, University of Washington and Berkeley. Uh, they all in the 20s had someone who you would say has missionary background. Goodrich was not a missionary himself, but his father was one for many, many years. And then you get uh, people who left Europe in the 30s or earlier, mostly Germans. Um, though Buberg was a Russian, um, that uh, come in and they had already been trained in Europe and they get jobs in the US. Then you have some of the Chinese who left before 45, and I give you a few examples there, what I consider the World War II generation, people who were either active in the war or started it during the war. Someone like Fairbank was you know, trained in Chinese uh, earlier in the 30s. There's a few people in the baby bust group of uh, people who would say starting college in the 50s. Baby boom doesn't really start college until 64, 65. Um, there are uh, almost all these schools had some people who are uh, Chinese who are coming from Taiwan or um, Hong Kong um, or came over from the uh, China, but 45 to 50. Uh, Vietnam War generation, it's getting bigger. I give you a few examples of uh, women who got PhDs before uh, 85 and some of the first, the first one who had an academic uh, position. And you'll see like if you do Columbia, Madeline Zellin, PhD 79, she's the first one they hired. And later on, as there was a little more pressure, I think, to hire women, some people who had a job elsewhere get hired. So like uh, Jun Fang Yu had taught for many years at Rutgers, and then I think she was already 60, gets a job at Columbia. Uh, and then you get more people who came over from the PRC beginning at least mid 80s or later. Um, if we think of it in terms of funding, you can certainly see that there are shifts over time. Um, early on, a lot of the talk was, we need to develop libraries, we need reference works. A lot of money got put into what was called the Dynastic History Project, trying to translate the dynastic histories. Very little that actually got published. The Liao volume came out and some of the Han volumes came out, but originally they were gonna do tons. Um, I've already mentioned 40s, you get the US government getting involved in many different ways. Say NEH, so NEH, I'm not sure when it founded. Of course, I could find it out, but say that's maybe mid to late 70s. Uh, for a while, they supported translations. And so quite a few people in the, my early phase, I think I got two translation grants when I didn't yet have a full-time secure job. So it was a way to support yourself. Um, 
Okay, and then more recently, we both had Jiang Jingguo money from Taiwan and Confucius Institute money from the mainland. Uh, and one big uh, um, cause people are trying to get money for today is various kinds of digital humanities, some of which projects are very expensive, you need to hire a lot of people. Okay, so the US social change, I mentioned that, and this is uh, something I've thought of as I've worked through these things. In the 20s to 50s, the wives of graduate students and professors, especially if they already had children, generally didn't work. And they didn't seem to mind spending three or four years in China. You could have two or three servants. <laughs> um, the, I, one of my uh, memoirs I was reading, uh, somebody, I think it's Theodore Chun, who ends up at USC, um, hit the wife's sister says, how could you possibly want to go to China? Here, you've got two servants. You get over there, you're going to have to take care of your kids yourself. Um, so that's one of the things that has changed. Of my own generation, I know quite a few cases where the thought of going to China for three years, assuming you're not both China experts, just doesn't work out. Your spouse can't be away from their own career for that long. Um, so that's something that has changed. Um, the first few women, and I'll show you on a slide next, weren't getting teaching jobs, mostly library jobs, occasionally research jobs. Uh, but as the expansion comes along, um, and then of course, birth control comes in, is fairly common in the 60s, so people could put off having children. And then something I've tried on a few people to see how they respond. Clearly, there's many more cases of American scholars marrying Chinese wives than Chinese scholars marrying Americans. And, you know, you can, you can think about why that might be. So here's some example of women entering the field. This is me going through uh, Shulman, because as I said, before 92, you can't really use ProQuest. So you've got Nancy Lee Swan very early. She ends up with the guest collection at uh, Princeton. Uh, Ruth Crater, more than a decade later, ends up as the first East Asian librarian at the University of Washington. Elizabeth Huff, that has a great oral history. Um, ends up at the Berkeley Library. And she has in this, she said, well, I would have preferred a teaching job, but my uh, advisor said, um, Columbia wants a librarian and Berkeley wants a librarian. Which one do you want? So I, th that's what's possible. One of the, um, Dorothy Borg basically remained a researcher. One of the first to actually do some teaching, um, 49 PhD, Itu Zen Sun, her husband was a scientist. The job at Penn State was really more his job and she wasn't working full time in the beginning, but she maintained a, a research career. Um, the one, if I had asked people a year ago, they would all bring up the case of Mary Wright. Um, but she actually works in the library for a decade before she gets a teaching job. She was at the Hoover. Uh, and then it all changes. So here, so if you take the whole 60s, I came up with 18 people, and I just listed some that you're more likely to have uh, to know um, with some of the dates. Then um, 1970 to 74, you get twice as many in only five years. Um, and again, I'm just listing a small number uh, that you might know. Um, then 75 to 79, it's almost double what it was in those first uh, five years. Um, and I would fit in that group. Um, 80 to 85, 118, you know, so it's, it's going up quickly, the number of women getting PhDs in the field. The whole field is growing too, but the, the rate of uh, women in it is growing up much faster than the whole field. Uh, and here I give you uh, a case here of one of the early women, partially because she has a very nice oral history. She uh, was not of missionary background, no connections to China, had been an English major at the University of Illinois um, and got a scholarship for one term at Harvard, uh, took a course with Langdon Warner, who was an art historian there, 
she found that exciting. Um, and her fellowship, for some reason, sent her then to Mills College in California, not too far from Berkeley, where she also did art history uh, with one of these German refugees, uh, Salmoni, if that's how you pronounce it. Um, she needs to support herself and gets a job at the uh, Chicago, the University of Library. Uh, Hurley Creel is already teaching Chinese there, and she uh, convinces him to let her in the class, so she starts with him. And then she gets a Harvard Yenjing scholarship um, for seven years to do a PhD. So she's able to go off to uh, Asia, uh, 39 to 40 in Japan, and then 40 to 46 in China. But that was broken up because two and a half years, she was in a detention camp in Shandong. The Japanese uh, interned a lot of people. Both rights have been interned, but um, Mary and Arthur Wright got out after six months with some kind of prison exchange, but she was still a graduate student. Maybe they still were too, but um, ended up the whole time. Um, and then she only spends like six months on the dissertation after she gets back and then gets this a library job at Berkeley. Okay, so, um, I try to keep in the back of my mind, are there things we should think about going forward if we think of the history of the field? Certainly something I see, if, if the goal is, let's have strong Chinese studies in the US, there's certainly high attrition at every stage. If you talk to people about who they were in graduate school with, a lot of them didn't become um, scholars in the field for various reasons. They drop out for various reasons, or they get a teaching job and never publish a thing. Um, that happens too. My own sense, and I've been discussing with some people here, is that great growth we had from, say, 1990 to 2010, maybe over, that um, more schools have someone in Chinese studies. We're not adding them at the same rate. So there aren't going to be as many jobs. The shifting demographics, um, current graduate students, an awful lot are from the PRC. Uh, a lot are the balance, the number the portion that are women is relatively high today too. Um, there are issues for the funders. You know, what, what is the best use of money to help sustain and help the field flourish? Um, I always thought, you know, fellowships are wonderful, like people getting to go to the Institute for a year to have a year away from teaching is a, a great thing for the field for people to get their projects done. Now there's competition from all these digital humanities projects that often take a lot of labor. So there's some, there's certainly some competition for what's the best use of money. And then at the AES uh, last week, the Association for Asian Studies, they had an interesting panel on um, China studies in geopolitically challenging times. And that was partially because no one's been able to go to China since COVID started. So if you had a graduate student who was just ready to go and do a field project, it didn't happen. So people are scrambling to find um, alternative things, alternative ways to do good research. It's easier for someone like me, who is a historian of the Song Dynasty, and we have all the texts. You don't have to go to China for an awful lot of it. Um, but for many things, that's important. And for more junior people who haven't spent any time yet, are you going to stick with the field for a long time if you never get to China? Um, OK. So I think I will stop there because I'm really hoping I get some um, interesting perspectives from people here. Thanks very much uh, for that sort of 360 degree <laughs> view of uh, how the field has moved in different directions uh, over the past hundred years or so. Um, I'd like to ask you the question. Okay. And I think you've hinted at uh, certain agendas that, that were setting some sort of priorities in the field, mm -hmm. uh, especially after the Second World War. Um, now, I'd like, to, I'd like to know more, a little bit more at least, about the Chinese so elite scholars who came to the United States 
uh, in the 30s and 40s and so on, and started to become very active in, uh, in major, major uh, American universities. Did they have some kind of agenda that uh, in some way influenced the field as you know, departments of area studies were being created? Because until the 1940s, there were very few departments where I mean the institutional setup for Chinese studies was not really quite a very not not very extensive. I think Yale, Harvard, maybe Princeton was only in the fifties. Princeton is relatively, relatively late. late. Yeah. So um, can you expand a little yeah. bit more on this? No, I mean that's an, uh, certainly an interesting question, and I'm not sure I'm ready to really generalize. Some of the people whose memoirs I've written were terribly. Um, Pro Guomindang, you know, some of them were utterly in shock on what was happening in China, and that's a part. But others were not. You know, I wouldn't say that that was uniform across the people who were there in the fifties. There were people who were had been left leaning who stayed in the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, so there was no fear in some ways that. You know, Chinese culture and civilization are going to be destroyed in China, and therefore. Oh, I think there were some people who felt that yes, very felt much. That way, I think yeah. there were definitely people who felt that, and that that was. Um, and America could could preserve. You, know, you could preserve it. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. Any questions? So you can tell me you've totally forgot about X. Martin. The CIA. Martin. Here's the mic. Oh. Yeah. The CIA. Right. There's the CIA. At and, the University of Washington. Um, well, and certainly the um, you, they, people often compared the University of Washington where there were some uh, very sort of pro KMT people and Harvard. So those were sort of two. And certainly there was CIA money in a lot of things. And some of these scholars who get to stay are indirectly being paid um, on CIA. I was talking to somebody in the last day or two, maybe, maybe it was uh, Nicola, uh, on the Tibet case, where it's pretty well documented that there was a lot of CIA money um, to try to, um, well, often to influence the course of events, but academics were involved with it. Mm. I didn't see that in any uh, current way, but I noticed when I look at this, this uh, so many of them came to the University of Washington, and I was often told by people that I have, uh, yeah, because this was, you know, supported by the CIA. But, you know, these were not people who were, as far as I could tell, who had any particular agenda in them doing their scholarship. So it was all time. Uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah. Um, so there's a couple of different things. Of course, some of them, like Fitvogel, had once been communists and have, uh, have switched away from that. And some of the biggest anti-communists had previously been communists. But uh, some of that government money is actually coming through uh, CIA. And people didn't always know either. I would say the Vietnam War generation there was a lot of suspicion that you know maybe even these national defense foreign language fellowships that we were all getting you know is this money suspect uh yeah mm -hmm. yes, thank, you. thank you um i am not a scholar of china or asia i'm a complete outsider but uh, um i learned a lot and i i very much appreciate the sort of sociology of knowledge. Um, uh, and I wonder, I'm sure this is a gigantic question, but I wonder whether in the written version of the book, you know, how do you trace, how do you map these sociological institutional changes onto the intellectual trends? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So just for example, you know, since Tibet was mentioned, is, Tibet, is the study of Tibet different chronologically or in content in Germany or, or in the US because of these kind of knowledge structures. So how, you know, so how, how, how do you, how do you um, 
anchor this map that you've drawn, you know, like the fact that the US has these close personal ties that are more Chinese students and scholars here than say in Europe, which were, you know, some of the examples you had shown earlier, but may have a different kind of political orientation or, or, or politicizations of funding. Is, is, are you also gonna treat how all this impact what is studied and how? Well, that would be the goal, is that I do want to make it a story with these, not just picking out one strand, but to say these things are interacting with each other. They're, they're not independent. Now, there are these, you know, you could draw some institutional differences. In Europe, they often had research institutes where people didn't have to teach. And that's, well, there, there is this institute, but that's very rare in the U.S., most people are at teaching institutions. Um, for the history of the field, there's a distinction between those where you train graduate students and those where you don't um, in terms of the direction of the field. I think, you know, some of the larger social change, much of what is going on is not, you know, specific to Chinese studies. Birth control affects everybody. <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, women entering fields are not just entering Chinese fields, they're entering all fields. Slower in the sciences than the humanities and social sciences, but we're talking about a general trend. But I think at least what I want to do is I want to bring that in. Many of the intellectual changes are much broader. You know, so environmental studies, Chinese studies didn't invent it. It's, it's a broad uh, interest people have it. And so some people are saying, you know, people would be excited if I tried to ask this question of Chinese materials. So often some people are more attracted to doing what's new um, and others have personality differences that way too, I think. Mm -hmm. Find at the University of Washington that a number of undergraduates arrive speaking Chinese because they grew up in Chinese speaking households. And has that made teaching easier? Uh, almost all universities today will have a heritage track and a non-heritage track. So there are um, a variety of groups. That is, there'd be uh, immigrants of the last 20 years. Um, you know, if they're two Chinese parents, they're going to speak Chinese to each other at home, and that child is going to learn a reasonable amount of Chinese. Some of them don't learn to read, and so th they'll be at at different levels, creating challenges. But that's true. Um, no, I think that's true. There's a, a fair, it will vary uh, across the country. It's more common in the West Coast, but you certainly in university communities, there's enough Chinese on the faculty that there will be uh, kids who, um, they're native English speakers, but they also know Chinese. Um, thank you, Pat. So um, in, in, in your talk uh, tonight, and, and, you know, we talked earlier today and yesterday, um, you've, you've emphasized, uh, you know, very persuasively, how all of the social and intellectual trends have uh, affected Chinese studies in the United States since 1920. Is there any example of um, the other direction? Yeah. Where... Um, revolutions in our field have affected the rest of society or is that well that's thinking? something we used to challenge ourselves on um i think maybe someone like bob hartwell would talk about that that uh well it's one thing for us to say um the medieval economic historians are pointing to this and that we should be finding things that they look for and i can't say i know a whole lot of really good cases that way, where the Chinese scholars have really been in the lead. Anyone here think that there's cases where, uh, okay, here's one, um, Pomerantz, The Great Divergence. That would be a case where a Chinese scholar looked very closely at um, 18th century economic history and stuff like that, and the Europeanists picked up on it and asked questions because of that book. And that's a great achievement. We all really respect that kind of thing, but it doesn't happen all that often. So I can think of a couple of very minor examples, like studies around anthropology. 
who other, oh, I'm sorry, um, people who work on, on, on ritual starting in the 90s and, and so on, who were not China specialists, were persuaded that Chinese sources were, were useful. But I mean, the examples I'm thinking of seem kind of marginal compared to something like how French historiography has affected us. Is, yeah. it, it, are, are we really so passive? It, yeah, and it's not that we want to be. Um, and some things like, um, say, anthropology, there's differences in what you could do at different levels of development. Um, so there were times when Chinese examples uh, would get widely cited beyond, but I think we're not quite there yet. We can think of that as a goal when Chinese studies um, results in as many new questions that people who are working on other parts of the world, not counting Japan or Korea, but people, you know, truly distant parts of the world think they ought to look for too. Yes. Are you aware of any examples where um, uh, Chinese scholarship may have infiltrated the the federal government in terms of uh, providing uh, learned policy making that the United States would use to uh, assess a proper relationship with uh, with China. I think there's a ton of that. Yeah. So, so there's like the Hoover Institution at Stanford was sort of devoted to that kind of thing. Um, and there was a lot of money, which wouldn't be hidden necessarily as CIA, it could be sort of State Department money. And uh, a fair number of people in the field who didn't immediately find a good academic job joined the State Department. I mean, I know cases myself. So I think there, uh, and that is part of the government's um, sense of why they should be supporting Chinese studies is partially to produce people who will help with State Department type things. Yeah, right. Especially these days, they, you know, who do they understand? We, we have the scholarship. Does our, does our political system really understand what we're you know, culturally? You know, what we should um, sometimes I think it's filtered through journalists. So there's a, a variety of people like, say, Nicholas Kristof, who at least started in Chinese studies, um, Ian Buruma, there are people who didn't, some did finish PhD, some didn't, but they're pretty good at making, uh, going from the scholarly work to either the general public or the people who might be forming um, policy type issues, but there's actually a lot of people who go directly to policy. That's in me looking over the field, I'd say there's two groups that don't have to um, become university professors <laughs> to be uh, researchers in fields. Art historians, there's museum jobs, and political scientists, there's government jobs. And a lot of political science, that's what they wanted from the beginning. So it's, it's not a trivial, uh, proportion of people. I'd like to share, oh, please. Possibly a new, <laughs> thank you. What you just said brought to my mind, <clears throat> the name of Doug Barnett, mm -hmm. who I think fits in with the kind he of- He fits in about. with that very much. Uh, went back and forth um, between government and um, uh, Michael Oxenberg from Michigan would be another person. A lot, uh, quite often, um, somebody high in an administration mm -hmm. with a China angle has come from a university. Actually, two or three of uh, Doug Barnett's student did also the same thing, uh, as you mentioned. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. I wanted to share with, with actually with everybody a little anecdote that has to do with this institute because uh, after 1945, the, actually before uh, in, in 1938, the institute had come uh, 
to uh, own a major library in, uh, in East Asia, in particular Chinese studies, which was the guest library. Now, the history of this acquisition is very long and complicated, and I'm not going to, but we had at the Institute this large collection, which was considered to be second only to the Library of Congress, Far Eastern collection. And Nancy Lee Swan was the that, that li librarian. Very early PhD. Very yes. early PhD. And, uh, and, and stayed at the Institute you know, with a salary from the Institute for many, many years. So the second director of the Institute, uh, Adelot, after Flexner, um, actually had a, a meeting of a lot of the people that you have mentioned, such as Fairbank, I mean, the people who really were mm -hmm. setting the stage for the development of Chinese studies in this country. In 1945, uh, or 46, I think 46, they met at the Institute to decide whether it was the case to create a school of uh, Far Eastern studies at the Institute. I mean, a whole school of Far Eastern studies based on our Having you know, the library. The library. And, uh, and it was inconclusive, <laughs> this, this meeting. And then the whole project sort of fizzled out when uh, Oppenheimer came as director of the, of the Institute. So it was not considered to be something that they would do. So there are some missed chances or missed opportunities mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that would be also interesting to include in your, in your uh -huh. study, uh -huh. I think, uh -huh. in what might have happened but didn't and why it didn't. Uh, and I cannot answer this question, but maybe um, the position, uh, difficult position of, uh, of Oppenheimer. You know, and, and maybe and physicists the, don't get any. Uh, but it was, it, was, it was political at that uh -huh. time. Okay. I think it yeah. was quite political. And then we have McCarthyism, where a number of uh, China, China studies people and Japanese studies people actually both were implicated. I mean, Owen Lattimore, bit for Right, yeah. One of my science. pictures at the yeah. beginning was Owen Lattimore, and that's a very famous case. Yeah. yeah. And we're caught up in this political climate with, with, with consequences for the field. Yeah. yeah. He ended up leaving the country. He yeah. went to England. Yes. Yeah. Yes, Martin. Uh, I was just thinking. Um, Chinese studies in America and X. And what is the X? Um, so I can think of a number of things. One would be, um, how does this story, how is this story related to what is happening in Chinese scholarship in China? Uh, let's say, especially in the last 30 years, on the one hand. Uh, and that goes in both directions. How do we change things in China in small ways? And how are we being changed? Um, another uh, dimension of that uh, came to my mind when I looked at this final slide, which uh, is kind of depressing, but probably right. <laughs> and especially in, you know, with now the great decoupling, uh, I think the first thing that will take a huge hit will be our language programs. Um, but um, on the other hand, we witness, I think I'm not the only one, there are many people witnessing that, that the other fields in the humanities are actually noticing that we exist. This goes a little bit back to Paul's earlier question, why, you know, do we have any influence on these people? Well, no, because we were always so, on the margins, uh, and certainly at Princeton as well, 10 years ago even, you know, when there was something in classics, they wouldn't invite a China person mm -hmm. to talk about China. Mm -hmm. Today they do. Mm -hmm. And this is true for all sorts of fields. So I can see there are lots of things that are still shifting. What do you right. think of that? And the complexity is certainly very high. Um, reading as I've been reading a lot of memoirs of people from 20s, 30s, 40s, and um, lots going on in Chinese scholarship in China in this period. So that uh, I would say probably it would be fair to say that the scholars from China are a little ahead of the American scholars in knowing what's going on intellectually in China. 
Um, but you know, a huge amount is going on. Sometimes you get the people in the US who don't like what's going on in China, like this uh, Guangdi Mei at Harvard taught Chinese language and stuff. And he's well known for not liking the May 4th movement, not liking people writing in the vernacular and all this stuff that many other people were very excited by. But I'd say, I would say today, I will have to admit, um, most of my graduate students have been Chinese. I'll often ask them what they think are some interesting things that have been uh, published lately. They'll be more up to date than I am of what's going on in Chinese scholarship. Mm -hmm. Have you thought about considering the growth of libraries as another one of your storylines um, for a couple of reasons? First of all, when you kept naming you know, the obvious leaders, with the exception of Michigan, which does have a good library, but not on mm -hmm. the level of the others, they're, they're also the, the schools that had the, the best research libraries in yeah. Chinese studies. And then the second reason is, you know, I thought of this when, when Nicola was talking about missed opportunities. The schools that didn't quite get off the ground are schools that for whatever reason had trouble establishing a, you know, a strong research collection in Chinese studies. And my university is one of them. You know, we, we try and we're, we're better now than we used to be, but we were hamstrung for decades by the fact that for whatever complex reasons, our library was third rate. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a good point. And I certainly intend to bring that in. And there's many good cases there of this thing about the 30s and 40s. There were some people coming in the 30s where you could buy up a lot of stuff. And then the late 40s, people are fleeing China. They're selling their libraries. There's a lot of big acquisitions that Elizabeth Huff, one of the famous things is getting Mitsui Library that had Chinese, Japanese, and Korean, great big um, acquisition. But it's partially, you know, it's the geopolitical times. Um, so I think the story of the libraries is a big one too. Um, that does, it's, it's great if you were able to get a big collection in the 30s or 40s and you get more string band books and stuff like that. But then um, Taiwan also starts reprinting things. And many libraries were built up by buying all the Taiwan reprints as well. Sort of responding to the fact they wouldn't have been able to print so many if the, there weren't 30 or 40. So I was talking to our librarian um, at the AES and she's, I forget exactly what she said, but more than 60 libraries she considered have real East Asian collections in the US today. They're obviously not all equally big. Thank you. This is very interesting. I just had one comment about the question on how do we matter, uh, and I, I want, I'd like to bring up the Needham project and the history of science. Yeah, no, I think that's a major example of pre-modern China studies changing the way in which a whole field think about itself. Uh, I was recently there this January, and I realized belatedly that Needham has remained a reader in biochemistry all his life. And so the Needham project was funded by the Wellcome Trust, among other sources. And it just, thanks to this old Cambridge system, he never became a professor in biochemistry. He did all this on, uh, as, as a reader in biochemistry. So somehow this kind of matching of a very 19th century system with his experience during the war end up cross-pollinating. Uh, yeah. Um, no, I think yeah. you're absolutely right that that's a case where um, study of China had a broader impact and people are coming from history of science to consider China. I left it out because it was the UK. I know. I know it really but... Where I thought the Cambridge histories, I could say, okay, they really mean the Cambridge of England, but Fairbanks, one of the co-editors, and Twitch had spent 20 years at Princeton our own. and their office was at Princeton. <laughs> and our own. Princeton. And Willard too, yes. Um, so that Princeton is a big part of the Cambridge. So I, I figured I can include the Cambridge histories as some, it's not hundred percent US, but it's heavily US. It but just, but need my, you know, yeah. I wouldn't go that far no, to right. claim that as US. No, no. <laughs> I, I just had this question about I was just staring at this slide and, and 
I just like to hear you talk more as I think of the younger generation today, and especially if you connect the high attrition rate point with the funding point. So what is it that we currently in the field can do to maybe think about ways of funding to maybe alleviate the attrition rate other than those two options that seems to me to be kind of tend to award the winners. Mm -hmm. So, And um, something that uh, maybe a little surprised me when I looked at these uh, funders reports from the 30s and 40s and 50s, they say it explicitly. Don't waste your money on the minor places. <laughs> Let's fund the major places. Um, Different funding organizations will have somewhat different priorities, but I think it's something we need to think about. Um, if you can create more money that goes to it, that's fine, but we should also think of a kind of balance, what's a reasonable uh, balance between um, things that used to be called reference aids, like eminent Chinese of the Qing period and Ming biographical uh, projects, and now is often digital humanities versus um, time off. My own gut feeling, but people, other people may feel differently. You know, say you're talking to someone who could uh, donate a few million dollars, and uh, professors don't make that big a difference to the future of the field <laughs> compared to, say, uh, fellowships. Um, donors may like it because they like their name being there in perpetuity, but um, the reference tools were probably on the whole pretty good, but there was one that was a total waste. Many people were hired for the great Harvard Dictionary. Um, so that a fair number of Chinese scholars got money at Harvard between 45 and 50, because they were gonna do this great dictionary. And some of these memoirs, they talk about it. Uh, I had to put in three or four hours a day, cutting up texts and pasting them on cards. Um, but the dictionary was never finished, you know, so that money was basically totally wasted. Mm -hmm. Yes. Contradiction between, I, I think there's a slight contradiction between your seemingly capacious China studies and this word attrition, um, which seems to me dangerous. I mean, there are lots and lots of people who don't get PhDs who study in our various programs or who get them, who go on to do other things that actually bring Chinese studies into the wider world. And they're much harder to study. Right. But I think there are lots and lots of them. So I, are you really well, sure the, you want to And I would say that? you can talk about attrition at, at various levels. I was starting with, uh, okay, you get 200 people in first year Chinese you're lucky if you have 100 and second year Chinese. You know, the language instruction, you have to teach an awful lot of people before someone's going to end up in Chinese studies. Um, that's okay, you know, Spanish, <laughs> the people who take Spanish don't necessarily do anything professional with it. The people who took um, an Asian studies undergraduate major and just go on to law school, it's maybe nice whether it affects the field much, I don't know. The people who do PhDs and uh, you know, go to the State Department, well, of course, that's still um, making good use of their education. They probably aren't contributing as much to scholarship as the people who um, pursue academic careers, but doesn't mean what they're doing is not important. Um, but certainly, some of the people who spend two or three years in graduate school and decide this really wasn't for them, they probably feel that they wasted some time. Mm -hmm. Someone who got a PhD from Chris Boat and went on to teach for a while and went into banking and lived in China for many years. I think you're derelict in ignoring me. Okay. Okay. And I know, actually, I know several people. I mean, I don't think I've ever met you before, but there were people who, my classmates, who when they, uh, there weren't many jobs, and maybe you did this totally purposely, um, but uh, went into banking. So I think I told somebody the other day, uh, 
most of the women who went to graduate school with me stuck it out. They would take one year jobs and whatnot. And most of the men um, went into banking or law or business. Several went to business school at that time. Um, chemical bank, if you had spent a year abroad in the Far East, would just give you a six month training program and uh, you could work. And so I you know, remember people like that too. Some of them were Korean or Japanese studies too. At that point, my friends were in all of them. Mm -hmm. There are no more questions. We just thank you again. <laughs> yes.